Lord be with you. Welcome to worship. Uh, the second last Sunday of the church year, if, that, if you're keeping track, I know that's, I do because it's my job, but also it helps us to focus on the themes of the day. These are themes of end of times, end of life, end of the year. We talk again, this is our last, our last Sunday in green. We've had green as our color, the season of growth and learning since the beginning of, since after Pentecost traveling together with Jesus, learning what it means to be both his disciples and the church together. And today we focus on Jesus' job as our high priest in our sermon this morning and what he's done for us. Our order of service is Holy Communion, setting two, setting four, which is the, the page numbers are in your bulletin. And uh, I guess just for those of you that may be guests uh, that we are having communion today, if you are unfamiliar with our practice, I think if you watch those in front of you, you'll catch on quickly. But the main thing to remember is just wait for the ushers to direct you, and they'll give you any instructions you may need as far as receiving the elements this morning. Everyone is welcome. Our order of service is um, we begin our service this Sunday as we do every Sunday at the, t at the uh, font of our baptism, the place where we were brought to receive the forgiveness of sins, the place where we return regularly to confess our sins and receive that promise anew this day. I ask you to please rise, turn in your red hymnal to page 116 for the service of, of communion. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open and all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done, things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Brothers and sisters, in the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our gathering hymn is 652. Please remain standing.
continues on page 147 at the front of your red hymnal, page 147. <clears throat> The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also in peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all. Let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. and defend us, gracious Lord. This is a feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. printed in your bullet. Almighty God, your sovereign purpose brings salvation to birth. Give us faith to be steadfast amid the tumults of this world, trusting that your kingdom comes and your will is done through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. first reading for today, the 25th Sunday after Pentecost, is from Daniel chapter 12. At that time, Michael, the great prince, the protector of your people, shall arise. There shall be a time of anguish such as has never occurred since nations first came into existence. But at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today's psalm is Psalm 16. We will read it responsibly. Protect me, O God, for I take refuge in you. I have said to the Lord, you are my Lord, my good above all other. All my delight is in the godly that are in the land, upon those who are noble among the people. But those who run after other gods shall have their troubles multiplied. I will not pour out drink offerings to such gods, 
never take their names upon my lips. O Lord, you are my portion and my cup. It is you who uphold my lot. My boundaries enclose a pleasant land. Indeed, I have a rich inheritance. I will bless the Lord who gives me counsel. My heart teaches me night after night. I have set the Lord always before me, because God is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. My heart, therefore, is glad, and my spirit rejoices. My body also shall rest in hope. For you will not abandon me to the grave, nor let your Holy One see the pit. You will show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy, and in your right hand are pleasures forevermore. The second reading today is from Hebrews chapter 10. This will also serve as my reading for the sermon this morning. Every priest stands day after day at his service, offering again and again the same sacrifices that can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since then he has been waiting until his enemies would be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. Verse 19. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through the flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. for the 25th Sunday after Pentecost is from Mark chapter 13. Glory to you, O Lord. As he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. And then Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one, of, not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. And when he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will this be, and what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? And then Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines, and this is but the beginning of the birth pangs. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Brothers and sisters in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. As I mentioned already this morning, and we're going to be looking at some of the words from the lesson in Hebrews, so you might want to keep the insert handy to follow along. But before that, I want to ask a question about a word that we use a lot, particularly here in this place, and I use a lot, and we use a lot in my life and work, and that is, I want to talk about the word religion. Have you heard that word before? <laughs> religion. What is it? What is religion? That's the question for today. Religion is what we do. Religion is the human attempt to get a handle on the key to life, to plug into the power, to find the program that leads to happiness, or meaning, or self-esteem, or whatever it is that gives a person life and purpose. 
So religion is not just for churches. Religion really is a system or a plan to get you somewhere you want to go. If your goal is to lose weight or to lower your cholesterol and you're serious about it, then your diet and exercise plan needs to be followed, as we say, religiously. Because it is your plan designed to bring you to your goal. If your goal is to buy that condo in Jasper, then your religion becomes your plan to get there. Whether it's playing the stock market or socking money under your mattress every month or a part-time job, religion is your plan to get where you want to go. Religion is your plan. One of the simplest definitions of religion that I have found is this one. Religion is the attempt by human beings to establish a right relationship between themselves and th something beyond themselves which they think to be of life-giving significance. For us, who call ourselves people of faith, religion is one word we use to describe our plan, our program, to find God. And you'd be surprised, maybe not, maybe not so surprised, at how many, many people would agree that my job and your job and the church's job is to sell our religion, to sell our product, to sell our plan to get to God. If you follow our religion, if you stick to our plan, and you don't fall off track and you work hard enough, then you'll reach your goal. I ask today, is this really what we're doing? Is this what we're really about? The vast majority of people out there believe that Christianity is a religion, which means they believe that Christianity is a system or a plan or a formula that will get you to God, something you do to get to God. And I want to say to you this morning clearly, friends, that this is simply not true. In fact, it is dead wrong. Christianity is not a religion. Religion, you see, to put it crudely, is not what we're selling here. Another religion, another plan, another system is not the message that we've received. And it's not the message that we're called to take to the corners of the world. Our message is something completely other than that, something altogether other than that. What is it then, Pastor? What is our message? Well, I'll get to that. But first, I need to tell you a story. It's the story of the day that God went out of the religion business and put it to death, put it to death once and for all. And now I want to look at our, our lesson this morning from the letter to the Hebrews. First, a little bit of background about the book of Hebrews. It's a book that talks about the temple of God a lot. The temple of God. If you've been to Jerusalem, you'll know that even now, the temple or the mountain of the temple is the place at the center of the city. And it was for centuries the heartbeat of Jewish faith. It was the center of worship for God's people. And in this, in this temple, there were many rooms, and there were certain rooms that only certain people could go. And there was one place that only the high priest could go once a year. And that was a room at the center of the temple called the Holy of Holies. And all year, there were many, many priests who worked at the temple. And their main job was to collect the offerings the people brought, whether it was animals or birds or money or all kinds of things, to bring them into the temple and offer them to God. The people wanted God to forgive their sins, so they kept bringing more and more and more and more. And in our lesson today, the, so the priests were very busy, you can imagine, constantly bringing the offerings of people into the hands of God, believing and hoping that God would accept them. In our lesson today, it, it notes that when the priests brought these offerings, they were always standing. Of course they were standing because they were very busy. Because if a priest is going to be setting things right between God and my sin, then he'll never get a day off. And it's so very sad, so very sad that still so many think that this is kind of what the Christian faith still is. We bring our best to God and we hope that it's good enough. 
That's religion. Is that our religion really? Is that what we believe? We pity the priest in the temple because his work never ends. The very busyness of the priest, the fact that there's no chair in the Holy of Holies, for the writer of Hebrews is testimony that in the end this religion really isn't working as he writes, and every priest stands day by day, day after day at his service, offering again and again the same sacrifices that can never take away the sins. The priest's work is monotonous over and over, over and over, bringing the same offerings, hoping that they will work. It will never be enough. They will never be enough. More and more will always be needed. And so the religion of bringing our best and hoping it's good enough for God will never be good enough. But now the story, the story of the day that this all changed. On one day, something happened that put religion to death. And we read about that day in the next verse of Hebrews. When Christ offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, what did he do? He sat down. He sat down at the right hand of God. Jesus sat down. Do you know what that means? But when do you sit down? You sit down when the work is over. Jesus sat down because the job was done, and he did it. The work was finished. The complete and final, once-for-all sacrifice was made for everyone. And on that day when Jesus sat down, we Christians believe that the religion of giving our best and hoping it's good enough was out of business for good. This religion is not our message. It never was. Our message is not a program or a system or a plan to get us to God. Our message is a promise. Our message is not about what we do. It's about what God has done. Our message has many names. We call it gospel. We call it good news. We call it grace. Some of you have heard these words for many years. Some of you are just hearing them for the first time this morning. But they all mean the same thing. Jesus sat down. And it happened on Easter Day, for the work was done. So if our religion is about doing our best day after day and trying to measure up to God, to get right before God, to do and do more, then religion is only one thing. It's more work and more work, and that's always bad news. Christianity is the good news that the work is over and that Jesus did the work for us on the cross. And then when the work was over on Easter morning, he sat down at the Father's side and said, Father, it's finished. I am full, complete, and the final sacrifice. The work is done. When Martin Luther started the Reformation, there was one question that everyone asked, whether it was the farmer at the plow, the artist at the pottery wheel, the servant in the house, the scholar in the study, or the lawyer pleading his case in court, the question 500 years ago was, how do I get right with God? I wonder if we ask that question anymore in 2021. Is anyone asking that question anymore? Well, maybe we're not as direct, but I think, or as blunt as back then with our questions, but I still think we have plenty of questions to ask. Like, where do I find love, real love? Is there such a thing in this world, or will evil always win? Does power always win? Will peace ever come to us, or will we all end up destroying ourselves? Where does guilt come from? Is guilty only a feeling that a therapist can help us get rid of, or does guilt go down to the very roots of who I am? If so, what can be done about it? What do I do with a conscience that always demands more than I can give? Do I go on trying to satisfy it? Do I have to li just live with the weight of it? Does death rob us of hope and threaten the meaning of existence? Or can death be defied? Where does all this hatred come from? What is it covering? What kinds of lies and delusions about ourself does it hide? So we have plenty of questions still. The Lutheran theologian Karl Broughton has summed up things this way. He says, modern people are still asking the same old serious question, 
whether there is saving power that overcomes brutality and hostility and replaces th such things with meaning and compassion and purpose and direction in life. How do I get right with God? Well, I believe that this is still the question simmering under all the others. How are we made right with God? What do we do? The church has an answer, but the answer must never be just one more plan, one more system, one more program to pile on your backs of something to do. Our answer must never be a religion. Our answer must never be about what we do. For our message, our good news, our gospel is always, always, always about what God has done and what God is doing. Eugene Peterson was a well-known Christian author and author of the Bible paraphrased the message that some of you may be familiar with. At his funeral, his son, Leif, said that after 29 years of ministry, and many books on preaching, he really only had one sermon that he repeated over and over again. It was a sermon that he whispered to his son over and over again over 50 years. And it was this. God loves you. God is on your side. God is coming after you. For God is relentless and he will not give up. Amen. This is exactly what these words from Hebrew means today. When Christ offered for all time a single sacrifice for sin, he sat down at the right hand of God. In other words, God's got no quarrel with you, brother. God's got no quarrel with you, sister. No more. We may keep trying to come to the cash register to pay our dues, only to discover that the bill has been paid. Jesus, the great priest, has done his work, and now he sits down. The work is over. That's good news. That's great joy. That's our hope. So this pastor tells you today, friends, stay clear of religion <laughs> because our faith is not about getting ourselves right with God. Instead, cling to the good news of what God has done for you. We, we have only good news to tell. We have only a promise to share, and that is this, that Easter on Easter day, Jesus sat down. Christ is risen. The work is over, not by us, but for us. And now in Christ and his cross, we can say that we are free. We are truly free. And this is good news indeed. Very good news. Amen. Please rise. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Our hymn of the day is 434. Please remain standing.
confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed on page 104. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated for the prayers. Let us come before the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ for the sake of the church, the world, and one another. Father, we don't want to hear about persecution or judgment or destruction. Kindle our hearts, fortify our minds, strengthen our spirits. Unite us to Jesus so that we stand strong even in the most difficult trials. For in even those worst times, we are called to love you with all of our heart, mind, spirit, and strength. And we're commanded to love our neighbors as ourselves. Give us your spirit so we desire and can do your holy will. Lord, in your mercy. Bless this church, bless your church. You have promised that though temples made by human hands may be destroyed, your temple of living stones shall live forever. Purify, preserve, and provide for it through your Holy Spirit, united always to your Son, its cornerstone and head, and make it a house of prayer for all nations. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Perfect the faith of this congregation, those of us who are gathered here at St. John's, so that we are bold to approach the throne of grace with our prayers and supplications. Conform us to your mind and your likeness. Use us to bring your forgiveness, life, and salvation to those who are far from you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your dear Son is the resurrection and the life. Grant healing to all who suffer, Give them a foretaste of his victory over death. Today we pray especially for Ben Bablitz, Horst Kuschminder, and the family of Elizabeth Liske. Bless all caretakers with skill, patience, and compassion. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Are there any other requests for prayer this morning? Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Please rise. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, 
and by his glorious resurrection open to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Praise you, Almighty God, for your faithfulness to us. We thank you for the promise of the new covenant to the houses of Israel and Judah, where all people will know you and praise you. In the fullness of time, you sent your word of truth, Jesus Christ, who, in taking our human form, redeemed us, though we were lost, with his holy suffering and innocent death, claiming us as his own, giving us his kingdom. By the Holy Spirit, bless these gifts of bread and wine, that they may be for us the body and blood of Christ, signs of your new and everlasting covenant in him. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. As we remember before your own Lord's sacred passion, his glorious resurrection and ascension and the promise of his return to make all things new, we ask you to keep us ever steadfast in him who is your word made flesh, the one who is your eternal truth, Jesus Christ. Through him, with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now we pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. This is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Lord, give us this bread always. Come, for all is now ready. Please be seated and follow the direction of the ushers. Please stand. Dear brothers and sisters, may this, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, in a wonderful sacrament, you'd strengthen us with the saving power of your suffering, death, and resurrection. May this sacrament of your body and blood so work in us that the fruits of your redemption will show forth in the way we live. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. May Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Blessed Sunday to you all. Welcome to visitors and guests this morning. I don't have too many announcements to make. Confirmation students will meet in the big hall. I, won't, I promise I won't make you go outside anymore, so I won't. We'll meet inside today in the main hall here in the building. I'll be there as soon as I can. And a reminder in the bulletin, 
that next Sunday we celebrate the last Sunday of the church year and our tradition at St. John's is that we remember all who have died from our community in prayer with, and with the lighting of a candle. And this year um, we also are inviting anyone who wishes to add have a name of a loved one read during the prayers to please contact the office. The information is in your bulletin uh, before, th before well, as soon as you can please so we can add those names to our list for prayer on Sunday. I don't believe I have any other announcements. I wish you God's blessings as you journey with Christ this week. Our sending hymn is 624. Please stand. <laughs>